Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, the very first verse, the Bible says, Amen. The Bible says, if I can find my place, the Bible says, I got so much writing in my Bible, I'm trying to find out where the Bible says it, Amen. It says that our brethren could not spiritual, uh, could could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for hither uh, two you were not able to bear it, neither yet are ye able, for ye are yet carnal. For where is there is, excuse me, for where is there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not, not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? Our Father, in Jesus' name, I pray God you'd help us tonight, and we'll thank you for all you do, in Jesus' name, amen, and amen. I'm preaching on this thought tonight on the problem of carnality, the problem of carnality. We've been going through 1 Corinthians, we've made it up to this point. In chapter number 3, we have seen how Paul has been dealing with the divisions in the church of Corinth. And the differences between the wisdom and the philosophies of this world, that is man's wisdom apart from God, man's humanistic thinking, and the preaching of the gospel, the wit, which is the wisdom of God. And there's a vast difference. There's a dividing line. Uh, the world in its wisdom knew not God. The world in its wisdom would never understand and could never understand that we could be saved and redeemed and made right by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross where Jesus died for our sins. And not everyone is able to receive the wisdom of God. Not everyone is able to understand the wisdom of God. In chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, or, uh, through 16 and then in chapter 3, verses uh, 1 through 4, we are introduced to three types of people. I briefly talked about them last week. And in dealing with these three people and introducing them to us, Paul shows us how these three types of individuals, they all have different and distinct ability to receive, or can I say not to receive and to understand the wisdom of God. I'll give them to you quick. Those classifications of individuals that are mentioned in verse 14 of chapter 2 is the natural man. And the natural man is the man who was lost. He's in his natural state. He is apart from God. He belongs to this earth. And he is like uh, just, uh, just a common natural man. That is, uh, that he is unregenerated. He's still in his natural state of birth. That is, he's born in sin. And so he's just like he was in his physical birth. He does not know God. He does not have the Spirit of God. He does not receive the things of God. He cannot receive the things of God. And the things of God, the Bible said, are foolishness unto him, despite whatever may be his intellect, despite the wisdom of the world that he's attained. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people that intellectually, they may have a high IQ, but they do not understand and they do not comprehend the things of God because they've never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They've never understood the gospel. They need their eyes uh, uh, to, to have the scales removed. They need, the, the, that they need God to remove whatever it is that the God of this world has over their eyes, blinding them. And many of them are steeped in religion. They're steeped in education and intellectual wit and the humanistic thinking of this world, which is the wisdom of this world. And so the things of God are foolishness to them because they think, therefore they don't think. Can I put it that way? They think they know it all. They think they have it all under control. They think they've got, they don't understand the things of God. They're trying to explain the world. They're trying to explain where you come from and wh what's going to happen. They're trying to explain everything apart from God. That's why they think there's aliens floating around out in the sky. There's no aliens out there. Hey, God created heaven and earth. God created everything that him is. He told us about it in the world. Are you listening to me? And God sent Jesus Christ to redeem mankind. And listen, if there's anybody alive, they had to be on this earth so that Jesus could die for them. Somebody say amen. And we, listen, I'm just simply saying, man apart from God, man apart from God tries to come up with all kinds of explanation in his own wit. And really, the Bible said he becomes full. Amen. They, they are those who separate themselves. They have not the spirit. 
And so they can't learn, know, perceive the things of God because, here it is, because they do not have the Holy Spirit of God. They do not have the spirit of truth to lead them and guide them in all truth. And then we're introduced not only uh, to the natural man, but we're introduced to the carnal man. Uh, we're, we're introduced to a carnal man. We read about him tonight. I'll come back to him in just a second. And then we're introduced to the spiritual man in verse number 15 of chapter 2. The spiritual man is that individual who's no longer in his natural state, but he is saved and he is led by and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He has not only been saved, but he has grown, he has matured, he has developed, he has, he has partaken of the things of God, and he has grown spiritually as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The spiritual man has grown. He's not only been saved, but he's growing each day in his process of sanctification. So the spiritual man, that, that has the idea he's spiritual, he's not carnal. In other words, he's not relying on flesh, but rather he's yielded to the Spirit being led by the Spirit of God. He is regenerated. He is saved. He, he, he does uh, have connection with the God of heaven because he has the Spirit of God within him. And the spiritual man is that saved individual filled with the Spirit of God, feeds on spiritual food. He has matured. He is led by, taught by, and guided by the Spirit of truth and by God. He's able to judge. Therefore, the Bible said, either the spiritual judgeth all things. That is, not that he condemns all things, but that he's able to, with spiritual eyes, through the Scriptures, to investigate and to examine and to scrutinize and make some decisions and some determination. He has discernment, if you will. Because he's spiritual. He's not going by uh, the seat of his pants through life wondering, well, what's right and what's wrong. He's not putting his thumb up in the air. But no, he has the scriptures of God. He has the spirit of God within him. He has the scriptures in his hand and in his heart. And the spirit of God uses the scriptures, which is the word of truth. And the spirit of truth guides him in all truth. And so he's able to judge all things. He's able to make some decisions. He has discernment. He's the one, he is the one in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that is able to prove all things, hold fast that which is good. He puts everything to the test. He doesn't just accept everything just because they say this is Christian music or this is Christian this or this is a church or this is what. No, no. He's able to put it all under the scope of the Word of God and he's able to discern and to make some decisions about everything. He proves all things. And the things that are not right, he lets it go. He gets rid of it, but he holds fast to that which is good. That's the spiritual man. Can I say to you, everybody that's saved is not necessarily spiritual. Everybody that is saved is not grown. Everybody that is saved is not filled with and led by the Spirit of God. Everybody that has been saved tonight is not necessarily being yielded and led by the Spirit of God. In fact, in fact, the spiritual man uh, is, is the man... Uh, that, that Paul writes about here, and he's not carnal, he's not natural, because the, the carnal man has some serious problems. The carnal man, the, now listen, uh, the carnal man is a saved man. Now I, listen, there's people who would disagree with this, but according to the Word of God, it's hard to get around this, that the carnal man here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 is saved, but he is immature. Paul says that. Paul said, I had to speak unto you as babes. But the word carnal has the idea of, of the flesh or fleshly. And so the carnal man is that one who's acting fleshly. He's, he's not yielded to the Spirit, though he has been saved. He still has the nature of flesh, and he's still yielding himself and surrendering to the, to, to the appetites of the flesh. He's still governed by his mere nature, not, not by the Spirit of God that lives within him. And so the, the carnal man is still feasting on the things that pertain to the flesh and to the body. He's still trying to please himself. In other words, he is saved, but he is not matured. Babes are those who are born, but they're still acting like their old nature. And so that's the one that Paul writes about here in chapter number 3. And Paul describes the Corinthians here. The Corinthians, the church at Corinth, y'all remember them? We've introduced to you the church at Corinth, how that God called them to be saints. 
God called them to be saints. I told you they had a lot. They they have a lot of problems. We'll we'll get into that. Paul's going to deal with a lot of problems, man. He's going to deal with some uh, some bad problems, if you will, in the next few chapters. But I, I want you to understand that he said these people that had these problems that are living according to the flesh. He said they are called to be saints. Everybody, all right. Now, the average independent fundamental hate everybody Baptist will tell you that oh, they're not saved. Well, the truth is, I can't tell if they're not saved. You can't tell if they're not saved. Paul describes these people as carnal, and he points out some problems with that. I want you to notice some problem with uh, carnality. The problem with carnality, number one, I see the, the, the deterrent of, of carnality. There's the deterrent. Paul said this in verse number one of our text. He said, and I, brethren, could not, could not. Not, not would not, but could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Now, no, let's just stop and read for a second. He said the first three words, and I who? Brethren. Paul is writing to brethren. He's writing to men and women who were saved. Are you listening? He's writing to saved individuals. Now, somebody will say, oh, the carnal person is not saved. Well, Paul thought they were saved. He said, and I brethren. Y'all see that? He said, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. He didn't say I couldn't speak unto you as you weren't saved. He said I couldn't speak unto you as unto spiritual. Everybody with me? There's a deterrent. He said, but how do us be? In other words, they couldn't hear. They're not going to receive spiritual matter. Why? Because they're carnal. They are still feasting on the things of the world. They're not going to be able to partake of. They're not going to enjoy the things of God. They're not going to be able to receive and understand. They don't spend time in their word, uh, the, the word of God. They're too busy spending all their time in the world. Are you all listening? They couldn't hear the things of God. They won't receive the things of God. They won't receive spiritual. You ever heard somebody, they come to church and the preacher preaches, one person over here says, man, that was good. God fed me tonight. And the other person says, I didn't get anything out of it. It might not be the preacher's fault. It might be used on the wrong channel. It might, hey, you might have, you might have had some distortion in, in the, uh, in the, in the pickup there. There, there may have been something in between you and what was being said. This is going over real good. Hey, Amen. Hey, I'm simply saying, hey, before you discount the preacher and everybody that got something out of it, you might want to make sure you're on the right channel. Might, may, hey, you might want to make sure you're tuned in and dialed in. Amen. He said, he, he said, I could not, I could not, brethren. Brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. I'm afraid we got a lot of people in our churches that they're saved, but when they come to church, they're not getting anything. When they come to church, they're worried about balancing their checkbook. They're worried about where they're going next week, and they're worried about their vacation, and they're worried about what's on the job, and they're worried about what's going on down at the park, and they're wondering, wondering about everything on television while we're at church, and they're wondering about all the things they're missing, and all their focus is on the things of the world. And then they get out of church, and they wonder why in the world the preacher didn't give them anything. Paul said, brethren, I could not, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. He said, but as, as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He said, hey, you're brethren, but when I talk to y'all, I have to speak to y'all as unto carnal. I have to, in other words, he said, you're saved, but I got to talk to you like a lost person. That's carnal, the person that's feeding on the flesh, that's desiring the things of the flesh. He said, I got to speak unto you as babes in Christ. The word carnal speaks of that which is fleshly or of the flesh. They were immature and they had little desire for spiritual things, the things of God. And so here's what Paul had to do to communicate with them and to try to help them. He had to talk to them like little babies. Could y'all imagine tonight if, if I'm going to put my man on the spot here, but could y'all imagine if, if Brother Wisdom came to church tonight, how long you been saved? 16 years. He's been saved 16 years. This is going to work real good. Come here. Could y'all imagine if a brother Wisdom came here tonight and I, I, I said, Oh, Wisdom, you little baby boy. You sure look real good. You've you been reading your Bible. You want some, you want some bottle tonight? Y'all think that was good? Now, Wisdom, I'm going to preach tonight, but I don't want your little feelings. You just sit down and you be real careful, okay? Please. Oh. 
And y'all think that's goofy? But I promise you, churches are filled with people just like that every week long. And the preacher, hey, listen, all, every, every week, week after week, you can thank him. And the preacher gets up and the preacher starts preaching against things. And the preacher starts teaching the things of God. And the preacher starts explaining the deep things of God. Sometimes he even starts uh, explaining things that ought to be pretty simple. And that person that's been saved 16 years, they've never read their Bible. They've never been faithful to God. They've never, hey, listen, uh, dove in all the way. They've never got excited about they they're too busy hey looking at the slop on television and listening to all the music of the world and they've never tuned in real good to the things of God and the preacher gets up and preaches and they think well he's judging me he's being too hard well where did he get that spiritual immaturity is a tragic hindrance among Bible believers so called Bible believers even now I'm telling you, our churches are full of people, not necessarily this church, I hope, but it's possible. But our churches are full of people across our land that they have trusted Christ. But they have never, listen, they have never really got involved in the things of God, got real interested and and started to feed themselves in the Word of God. And when the preacher stands up and starts preaching, maybe somebody starts preaching about the mysteries of the kingdom or the mystery of the New Testament or the mystery of the, uh, of the body of Christ. And they start preaching them, and they're sitting there thinking, what's he talking about? I don't understand. Because Paul said about those carnal people that when I talk to you, I can't talk to you like I talk to the spiritual people over there. That when I talk to you, I got to come in here and I got to talk to you like a little baby. Oh, Gucci, 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 I don't want to hurt your feelings. Oh, poor brother. He said, I got to talk to them like babies. Hey, I'm telling you, churches are full of people like that. There's the deterrence. Not only is there the deterrence, but there's the deficiency of carnality. Notice verse number two. He said something about the diet of their deficiency. Their diet was limited. Look what he said. He said, I have fed you with milk, not with meat. I fed you with milk and not with meat. In other words, they couldn't handle anything beyond meat, uh, beyond the milk. They They couldn't handle the meat. They couldn't bear and handle strong meat, spiritual meat. Now, I'm going to be honest with y'all. Uh, when I was a kid, I liked milk. And I'll tell y'all what kind of milk. Y'all know what kind of milk I like? Red top, vitamin D, whole milk. Praise God. We don't do blue top and purple top. We don't do green. We do the red top. You with me? Red top? Red top? Red top. All right. Amen. You sure? Red top. Okay. Amen. And so I like red top. And guess what? I am 49 years old, and every once in a while, Brother Steve, I'm just giving him a hard time. Hey, it's, he, he's all right, ain't you? Hey, man, he going to go home and get him some red top milk. Hey, I'm simply saying, hey, every once in a while, I go over to the refrigerator, and I'll get that jug of milk, and I'll get this wig at Lake, and I'll say, what you doing drinking milk? Hey, even though I'm an adult, I still like to drink milk once in a while. Y'all like milk? Milk? Hey, I like that old commercial. Milk, it does the Body good, praise God. Peter said, as newborn babes, that's the little ones, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Milk is good. Hey, listen to me. Milk is good, but it shouldn't stay your diet forever. Because when I was a child, I spake as a child, I drank milk as a child, but when I became a man, I put the milk to the side and grabbed me a ribeye, praise God. I grabbed me some barbecue chicken. Somebody say amen. And hey, you're not going to go home tonight and get you some, some, is it Gerber or Gerber? I don't know. You're not going to go home and get that tonight. You're going home and you're looking for some meat. You're looking for something good. You're looking for a hamburger or a hot dog or a chicken leg. Praise God, I'm going home with you. Pork roast. That's what I had for lunch, actually. Hey, and it was good, too. Hey, watch. Hey, I'm simply saying I didn't go home and have a milkshake. I like a milkshake once in a while. Matter of fact, I'd drink one every night if you bring it to me, and I'd be about that big. It ain't the healthiest thing in the world, but it sure is good. 
But hey, I'm, t- I'm simply saying, just like you graduate off the milk physically, you need to graduate off the milk spiritually. But Paul said, Paul said that their diet was limited. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Why? Because they're babies. You remember what, what the writer, I almost said Paul, I don't know if it was Paul or not, probably was, but in Hebrews chapter number 5, verse 12, he said, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are, watch this, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. There it is. He said there's some people that, hey, they should be eating meat, but they had kind of reverted back, and, and they hadn't grown. They hadn't progressed. They had digressed. They couldn't eat the steak anymore. They'd gone back to the milk. He said for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's a babe. There it is, a babe, carnal, babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, mature. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So when we talk about the the milk and the meat, it's not necessarily good or bad, but it could be that he's speaking of the elementary things like the gospel. Everybody who's saved understands the gospel. Everybody who's saved ought to enjoy the gospel. Right? But if you're saved, how many knows if you're saved, you need something more than the gospel every week? Right? You Listen, you need to grow the, the gospel, and then you need to know how the gospel applies to my life every day. I, I believe the gospel. I believe what Jesus did for me at the cross when he was uh, crucified, and he died for my sins, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. I believe that, and I was saved. And now that I'm saved, now i got all those epistles that Paul wrote in the New Testament. I've got all that New Testament church doctrine. I, I've got all that doctrine there where he shows me how that gospel is not only to be believed one time, but it's to be lived out every day of my life. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ live within me. He's talking about, he's talking about an exchanged life. He's talking about now Christ is living through That's the yielded life. That's the surrendered life. And so some would say that the, the milk here is representative of Christ's earthly ministry and how the believers would understand that. But then the meat would represent Christ's present high priestly ministry. So there's a lot of people in church that you can talk to them about what Jesus did while he was on earth, and they get it, and they're with you. They understand the base things. They understand those elementary things spiritually. But when it comes to what Jesus is doing right now, they don't grasp it. And Paul says, I can't talk to them about that. And so uh, remember, milk is good, 1 Peter 2, 2. It has its place. It has its purpose. It helps us grow. But here you've got people that were drinking Milk instead of eating meat when they could have been eating meat. Now, Miss Barbara, I like milk. I really like it when you put that Nesquik strawberry stuff in it, like a double portion, to where it ain't just pink, but it's starting to turn a little red. I really like that. I ain't going to lie. I like to put the straw in there and blow bubbles. Ain't that right, Mary? Amen? Hey, watch this now. I like milk. But could you imagine, could you imagine that you and I, Brother Tyler, could you imagine going out to eat with a preacher and we went to the Texas Roadhouse and you ordered, like Brother Steve, if you if you with Brother Steve, you order a big old salad, a side of chicken, and then a ribeye about that thick. Hey, and, and you're going to eat that ribeye. You like ribeyes? You all right. Hey, what, hey you eat that ribeye. And while you eat that ribeye, I say, I don't want anything. Just bring me a glass of milk. Hey, can I tell y'all something? Over my dead body. Hey, if you see me pass up a ribeye for a glass of milk, you know I'm sick, my teeth broke, or I know something bad's wrong with that ribeye. Somebody say amen. But yet, hey, but yet we got people that I'm saved, preacher. I, I don't give me no meat. I'll just take the milk. Ba- listen, 
babies eat baby food. It's normal. Is that right? My children, man, they, they like some milk. They still like milk once in a while, but they're starting to graduate to orange juice and pineapple orange juice and apple juice. And every once in a while, starry or Coca-Cola. Punch. Grape juice. It used to be milk, 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 milk. Man, we go out to eat. You know what? Daddy, I want some of your steak. I'm like, eat your chicken nugget. I want your steak, Daddy. You know what, Brother Rodney? They're growing up. They're growing up. Their body now, as it develops and matures, Brother Wayne, it's able to process stronger meats. It, it, it needs the meat to grow. It needs the protein. And I tell you something, your spiritual body or your spiritual man inside of you, it needs more than milk. Thank God for the milk. It has its place. It has its purpose. But the milk carries you to where you develop, to where you can now eat the meat of the world. And you can get in there and you can read it and thank God for John 3.16. But now take me to 1 John 3.16 and take me to Romans and take me to Thessalonians and take me over there and teach me some things. You see, the mature man is now, he, he, comes, he becomes able to understand some things and he grasps doctrine. But the carnal person, though they're saved, they're still worried about everything on television instead of picking up their Bible and read it. They're the ones that says, I can't read, but they watch TV for 14 hours a day. If you can watch TV for four hours a night, you ought to be able to read your Bible for at least 10, 15 minutes. Somebody say amen. At least hold it and act like you're reading. But the carnal person, though they're saved, they're not able to get a hold of the things of God. They're not able to, to grasp it. They would read it and say, I just don't understand. Now, let me just say this. Nobody understands everything the first time they read it. It takes digging. It takes mining. It takes reading. It takes even listening to some teaching sometimes. But we're, we're living in a day... Or we got scores of people sitting in our churches and they want to hear stories. They want entertainment. They want somebody that's exciting in their delivery. Are you listening? But they're bored by Bible doctrine. You say, well, we're going we're gonna to have, have a camp meeting and, and you could just about name names. We could call different guys and they're not all bad. But people would say, oh, I like to hear him preach. Oh, he's exciting. Oh, he jumps. And he hobbles. You say, we're going to have a Bible doctrine class and we're going to come in here and study the Bible. Ah, it's too deep for me. You just told on yourself. I'm telling you, we got scores of churches that are built on hype and not holiness. We got scores of churches that love the preacher's delivery, but they don't know anything about his doctrine. They don't, look, they don't listen to what he preaches. They're too involved in how he preaches. Y'all know me. I like excitement. I like to run. I like to jump. I like it. I like it hot. Y'all, you know what I'm saying? I was born in the fire. Smoke won't do. I, I like it hot. But just because a man runs, jumps, and hollers don't mean that he's saying the right thing. We got, we got some circus clowns in the pulpits, and I'm talking about Baptist churches, praise God. You all right? So there's a deficiency, a lacking of, of the doctrine. And then I got this. I see the duration of their deficiency. Verse 2 and 3, the latter part of verse number 2, he said, watch this, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither, watch this, neither yet are ye able. Another, hey, for hitherto, and that's up to this point, but now you're not, you, you, you are not able to bear it, but now neither are ye yet able. In other words, there's been some time, you see that? It'll get clearer in the very next verse, verse 3, for ye are yet carnal. In other words, hey, listen, in other words, they had had time to grow, but they had not progressed. They had been saved long enough where they ought to have grown up some, but they had not. They should have matured. They should have been at least nibbling on that chicken leg. 
They should have been at least sniffing on that ribeye and trying to chew on it. Y'all know I'm using that as a picture of the ribeye. I'm talking about the, the doctrine, the Word of God. They might not understand everything in Daniel 9, but at least they's reading it a little bit. But they ain't got time for that. They can go to church and hear the preacher preach the gospel every Sunday, even though they got saved 20 years ago. They're not going to read their Bible. They're still carnal. It's not, listen, nobody is instantly mature today. The day, I don't know when you got saved. Was it in the 80s, 90s? When were you ready? 90s, all right. The day she got saved was in the 90s. But the day she got saved in the 90s, she didn't know what she knows now. She had not matured to the point that she is now. I'm picking on her because she's on the front row. I'm not really picking on her. I'm simply saying, have you learned anything since the 90s that you did not know when you got saved? Have you had it applied to your life more since the 90s than you did up at the yeah. See, You see how that works? Nobody born again, boom, instantly spiritually mature. No, we are born babes as newborn babes desire to enter no more. We are born again. When you're born again, you're born a baby. You're a child of God, and it takes growth. Growth. Are you listening? We need to grow, every one of us. So it's not, it's not that because you have some carnality in your life that, boom, you're, sa- you're not saved. It's that, hey, you might have had some carnality in your life when you got saved. But 15, 20 years ago, uh, down the road, that carnality ought to start going away. You ought to grow up. You ought to learn something. You ought to grow. Mature. And they had been saved long enough for the half. Number three, I've got to hurry. There's a demonstration of carnality. You see, carnal people not only have an appetite like a baby, but they act like babies. A saved person who is carnal is hard to distinguish from a lost person. Matter of fact, some would not even believe that a carnal person were saved because of the way they act. You listening? There's some people in church that I, I, if you just ask me, are they saved? I said, well, they say they are. There's some people that I'll say, yeah, I believe they are. By their life, and by, by their zeal for the Lord, and by their hunger for the things of God, that's yeah, pretty good evidence. I believe they're saved. But there's other people that come to church and say they're saved. And you, if, you was to, if I was put on the spot and I had to, I, which I'm not God, but if somebody asked me, are they saved? I'd say, well, they say they are. I can't tell. Not a whole lot of evidence other than the fact that they said they got saved. Never seen a real hunger for the things of God. Never seen a real change in their life. Never seen a desire to serve God. See a lot of, see a lot of discourse. See a lot of problems. See a lot of things they don't like at the church. Are you listening? The lost person will come to church, a lost person, a lost person, the natural person will come to church, he's not going to like nothing. He's not going to agree with nothing we, we preach. Oh, he may sit there and act like he does, but deep down inside, if he's not saved, he ain't liking it. You know what the Bible says here? The Bible says, for you are yet carnal, fleshly. For where he is, watch this, whereas there is among you envy. Here's Paul describing those people he called brethren people he called babes, the people he called carnal. He said, there's among you envy. That word envy comes from a word, it speaks of a heat or a zeal. In a favorable sense, it would be uh, like an ad- adore, but it, in an unfavorable sense, here, as he uses it here, it's like jealousy. Like a husband that's jealous. There's a, there is a, a sense of this envying where it's like malice, emulation. Are you listening? It's a fervor of the Spirit, embracing and pursuing and defending anything with an envious and a contentious rivalry or jealousy. He said there's, y'all, y'all ain't going to get this. He said there's people in church that are envying. They're jealous. Y'all never believe me. Not in a Baptist church, preacher. 
There's people in church that, well, they didn't sing my song, and they get mad. Or, no, they didn't ask me to do that. They didn't ask me to pray. They didn't ask me to, and they're jealous. Or who does she think she is sitting up front? She thinks she's somebody. Who does she think she is with that new dress on? Who does she th- who's he think he is teaching that class? You all right? There's envying. Well, they got something new. Well, they must have been backsliding or they wouldn't have been able to afford it. Maybe God just blessed them for their obedience. There's envying. There's strife. Oh, the word strife here is the word contention. Wrangling. You know what the Bible said in Proverbs 13, 10, that only by pride cometh contention. It's like a debate, variance taking place in the church. They always got something going. Listen, they're always debating. They're, they're always wrangling or, or at strife with someone. There's always that contention. Might be with another member, might would be with a preacher. Are y'all all right? And then he said, and divisions. Remember now, he's writing this, 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 this letter to a church that he said was full of schisms, divisions. His word division has the idea of seditions or dissension. And when he talks about the envying and the strife and, and the divisions, he's using that to describe not the lost man, but the carnal, the one who's saved, but they're not growing. And he says this at the end of verse number three. He said, are ye not carnal and walk as men? You walk as men. In other words, you're acting just like the natural man who does not even have the spirit of God. You're coming to church and telling everybody you're saved. And you're going out here saying, oh, how I love Jesus. But when there's a decision to be made or when there's a something that comes up, instead of you yielding to the Spirit and submitting yourselves one to another, you're raising up in pride and you always got to have your way. And you're displaying your carnality through your envying and your strife and your divisions. He said, you're, act, you're carnal. You're acting like the lost man, you're walking as men. When he says you walk as men, that's like natural man without God. And then number four, watch this. Talking about carnality, we see the deception of carnality. Looking at number four, he said, For while one saith, I am a Paul, and another, I am a Apollos, are you not carnal? He has described the carnal man. He has described the babe in Christ who should not be a babe. They should have grown. It would be like coming to a 16-year-old's house and he's still in the playpen, sucking on a bottle, wearing a diaper, making a mess, fussing about everything. All right? And you come in church and you got people sucking a bottle because they ain't graduated to the meet. They wearing a dapper because they can't clean up after themselves. They make it a mess because they always got to have their way and they're fussing about everything because they haven't grown. He's talking about carnal. He said, you're carnal. Watch it. And, but, but yet here's what they say. I'm a Paul. Well, who was Paul? Paul was the missionary evangelist, right? Paul was the one who was writing over half the New Testament. Paul was starting all these churches throughout Asia. Paul, I'm a Paul. In other words, I got saved under Paul. Paul's my favorite preacher. I follow Paul. Well, that sounds real spiritual, don't it? You're a Paul. Oh, in other words, I'm not carnal. I'm a Paul. And the other ones over here say, well, I'm a Paulus. Apollos is that eloquent speaker. He's the speaker who is an edifier. He, he don't, he's not necessarily the evangelist, but he's the one who's helping build the body of Christ. And he's building everybody up. He's teaching us something. And so they sit over here and say, well, I'm not carnal. I'm of Apollos. I understand Apollos. I follow Apollos. I, I love to hear Apollos preach. Look back in chapter 1, verse 12. Remember what Paul said? He said, now I say this, that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, and I have a Paulus, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. They divided it four times. 
Everybody all right? And then I told you, I told you that it's very likely that Paul, as in chapter 4, verse 6, wasn't necessarily speaking of Paul or Apollos or Cephas or even Jesus, but in chapter 4, verse 6, he's using them as a like figure. He said, I figure in a figure I transferred to myself into Apollos for your sakes. That you might, watch this, that you might in us not learn not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for, against the one another. In other words, he, he may have been just using his name and Apollo's name as an example, but that these people in Corinth who were carnal were saying, well, that's my favorite preacher, and that's my favorite preacher, and I, I like him, and, I, and you like him, and so I'm spiritual because I like him. You know what that reminds me of? Here's what Paul said about it. Paul said, are ye not carnal? Of course they were carnal. He just sat there and described them and told us exactly how they were. As carnal and as childish as they were, though, they had deceived themselves to believing that they were spiritual based on who their favorite preacher was. They were more interested in personalities than they were biblical principles. They elevated the men over the message. Sounds a lot like 2024 to me. I declare, you got people that you, you, you have a preacher that's faithful and he preaches the Bible and he preaches the word, that's boring. But you let the right evangelists come in town and everybody will leave every church in town and flock to the tent. Never mind that they twist scripture, never mind whatever they say and do. They're exciting. Everybody loves them. Let's go. But you let a man stand behind the Bible at the pulpit and give it line upon line and precept upon precept. And oh, man, that's boring. I, don't, I just don't know if I'm coming back on Sunday night. I don't think I can handle that Wednesday night anymore. But many people have their favorite preacher. But they can't handle or bear, as Paul used, they can't bear straight Bible doctrine, Bible preaching. Man, you, you go back 30 years and you listen to some of the old preachers. They didn't get up and tell stories. They, they wasn't into building uh, skyscrapers, you know, one story after the other. You might find a good preacher occasionally. He, he was a good storyteller, and it was exciting, and he was able to make an application out of that. But the greatest preachers were those that opened the Bible, taught you doctrine, compared Scripture with Scripture, and, and used the Bible as a commentary to Bible, and they told you what the Bible said. You know what's going to help us is the Bible. You know how we're going to win souls in Walnut Cove? is by preaching the Word of God. You know how you're going to win souls in India? is by preaching the Word of God. You know how the church is going to be built? If the church ain't built by the preaching of the Word of God, it ain't going to get built. You can have a club, and you can have a circus, and you can have your concerts, and you can have your shows, and you can, listen, you can light a fire. You can do all you want to do. But I'm telling you, if it's not based on the foundation of the Word of God, when the winds come and the rains come, it's going to sink on sinking sand. I'm telling you, if you want a church that's going to be rock solid, if you want a church that's not going down but it's going up, you build it on the preaching of the Word of God. Many people don't want to hear that Bible doctrine. You say anything about doctrine. I've heard preachers in our day say, well, we don't, we're not going to make a big deal out of doctrine. But Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continue in them. For in doing so thou shalt both, watch this, save thyself and them that hear thee. Doctrine's pretty important. It's pretty important, Brother Jimmy, not just how we say it, but what we say. Carnality is a problem. Carnality is a problem in our churches. We've got people that will run to crusades and run to meetings, and they'll flock to their favorite preachers, and they'll shout and holler. And watch this. 
they'll, they'll leave that meeting and they'll go get in their car and they'll turn on their rock music, country music. They'll go back home cussing and swearing and smoking and hating each other and drinking. But they'll go to church. And I'm spiritual because I like my favorite preacher. No, you're spiritual. Listen, you're spiritual when you are saved and you are filled and led by the Spirit of God. Led by the, not that you obey the preacher and everything he says, but that you're submitted to the Lord and to his word and everything God says. And the cure, here's the cure for carnality. The cure for carnality, this is straight up. Y'all ready for this? Grow up. Grow up. What did Peter say in 2 Peter 3, 18? But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so he's telling the church of Corinth, hey guys, grow up. Quit acting like a bunch of babies. Don't be so carnal. You ought not be acting like the world. You've been saved. You're called to be saints. You shouldn't be divided amongst yourselves. You, you know why churches have splits? Because of carnality. I had several preachers in the last few weeks. Preacher, man, what a spirit in your church. What a spirit of unity. What a sweet spirit. What a great place to preach. What liberty to preach. You know why? Because there's some spiritual minded people in this church. That don't mean everybody is. That don't mean they are all the time. But we ought to want to be. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, you get around spiritual people and it'll challenge you to be spiritual. You'll either want to be spiritual or you'll have to get away from them. Are you listening? The cure for carnality is spiritual growth. Grow up. May God help us. Father, I pray you take the message, use it. Help us tonight. Help this church. Help me. Help us all, Lord. Be yielded to you, led by you. Help us to be obedient when you speak. Help us to be submissive to what your word has for us. Help us tonight for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're standing all across the auditorium. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Some are coming. If you need to come, the altar's open. You mind the Lord. If you need to come tonight, you mind the Lord. God spoke to your heart. God spoke to your heart, whatever it may be, between you and God need prayer, we'll pray for you. If you need to be saved, God wants to save you. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, Preacher, I'm not where I need to be, but I want to be. Let me tell you something tonight. An altar is a good place to make that start. An old-fashioned altar is a good place to make that start. You mind the Lord as she plays. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Have you decided? to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back